What's up YouTube? It's the Action Figure Grader coming back to you with another video and I haven't made one of these videos since April. I went back and looked on the channel and I haven't shown you any of my recent comic book pickups in about five months now and I thought it would be a good time to do that because I have picked up some pretty awesome CGC 9.8 graded comic books, Star Wars and also non-Star Wars books that I just thought would be kind of fun to show you guys on the channel. And I haven't bought an action figure in a while because, uh, you know, the, the comic book market is down. And I thought now was a really good time to pick up some really big books to add to my collection uh, while prices are well down versus some of the comic book highs that we saw in 2021 and into 2022. So I'm going to go through these kind of rapid fire here. And if you uh, have any questions about them or just want to talk more about them, just leave a comment and I'll try to answer some questions. But the first one I'm going to show you is a non-Star Wars book, but it goes really nicely with these two War of the Bounty Hunter Alphas, number one. And uh, these were Mike Mayhew Studio Edition covers that were homage covers to New Mutants 87. And it's just kind of an interesting uh, kind of comparison I wanted to show you because I did buy the original book that th these two books are based on in terms of the cover homage or homage. Homage is the right word. Uh, so here it is. This is New Mutants 87. Uh, this is the first appearance of Cable and Strife as well as the Mutant Liberation Front. This is from 1990. A, a pretty famous Rob Liefeld, Liefeld cover and I, I thought it would be kind of fun to kind of show all of them together so you can see what the homage covers for Mike Mayhew look like for War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha number one versus the original book from 1990. So pretty cool. This is, the, again, the first appearance mainly of Cable. And I bet we probably see him again in Deadpool 3. Uh, but just a great looking book. I picked this one up probably in May and uh, just hadn't had a chance to to kind of show it yet. But here comes the man called Cable. Here comes the man called Boba Fett. And they even did a nice homage with uh, the other mutants that uh, that were kind of shown there in those little bubbles. So very interesting how they did that and a pretty great comparison. Next up, I have a couple of Spider-Man related books, Spider-Verse related comics. And the first one was an incredible gift from Patreon supporter and good friend, Jason W. Uh, this is Edge of Spider-Verse issue number two from 2014. And if you guys follow my comic book videos at all, you know that I love the Spider-Verse animated movies. Uh, starring Miles Morales and, more importantly, Spider-Gwen. And I just thought they were some of the best animated movies ever made. I really enjoyed both Into the Spider-Verse as well as Across the Spider-Verse. And I became obsessed with uh, Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales. And I don't have the first print of Ultimate Fallout 4, which is the first comic book appearance of Miles Morales, although I'd love to get it one day. I've got the second print already. But Jason... Jason was a crazy person and sent me this as a gift. It arrived on my doorstep, and I was convinced that it was an accident. But uh, this is Edge of Spider-Verse number two in the first print, and this is the first appearance of the new Spider-Woman, Gwen Stacy. So uh, Sp Spider-Gwen is pretty awesome in, in the animated series, and I, I can't thank Jason enough. It's just way, way too generous of a gift. I think there are either four or five printings for... Edge of Spider-Verse number two, and there's obviously a, a, a facsimile version as well, but he got me, he sent me as a gift the first print, which this is just an insanely generous gift, and I can't thank him enough, so I, I really appreciate you sending that to me. Uh, kind of beyond words when I got that. I mean, this is not something that you usually send to somebody as a gift. It's just a, a very, very pricey book, so uh, thank you for that. And then here's another one I picked up a while ago. This is a a 1980s book. This is Amazing Spider-Man number 316. Uh, this is a Todd McFarlane cover. Uh, and I, again, I apologize for the glare on my comic book videos when I show you guys stuff. It's, it's just really hard to film these big acrylic slabs without major reflection. But this is a pretty infamous or famous book uh, done by Todd McFarlane. And uh, this is actually the first full comic, uh, comic book cover appearance of... Uh, uh, of Venom and you know obviously his first appearance comic ASM 300 Amazing Spider-Man 300 is a very pricey book the direct edition goes for anywhere from 3500 to about 4000 the newsstand can go for over $10,000 so maybe one day I can save up enough money for ASM 300 it's definitely probably the biggest book left on my goal list but uh, this one 
uh, I, I thought was a nice addition, and I, I always love this cover. I remember reading this book when I was a kid. I, I long lost my original copy I had as a child, but I, I did pick up uh, ASM 316, uh, you know, in a 9.8 just to add to my Spider-Man collection. But uh, what, a, what a great pair. We've got the first comic book cover appearance of Venom, and then obviously the first comic book appearance of Spider-Gwen. So pretty amazing books to add to my Spider-Verse collection. And speaking of both Todd McFarlane and my childhood, I did finally uh, kind of in the in the stalemate that I had with myself as it relates to G.I. Joe comic books. I was always afraid to start picking up G.I. Joe books because if you guys have watched the channel for a long time, you know that I love G.I. Joe. I used to have a huge AFA graded mint on card G.I. Joe collection and uh, I since sold all those off, but I've been kind of putting off getting any Star, or excuse me, any GI Joe books because I knew that once I did, the floodgates will be opened. So I do have some books from my childhood, and the first one is this one. This is GI Joe, a real American hero, number forty-nine, and this is the first appearance of Serpentor, Lift Ticket, Slipstream, and Leatherneck. But uh, obviously, it's a, a fantastic cover done by Mike Zek. Mike Zek w was probably my favorite comic book cover artist growing up and uh, this one I, I vividly remember reading and rereading and rereading and I always wanted it I just thought it was such a great cover with Destro and Dr. Mindbender uh, stealing the bodies of famous emperors and dictators uh, to, to kind of use the DNA to create Serpentor so that's probably the lowest of, of, of the G.I. Joe books I've picked up so far I've picked up three of them uh, but that one, I, when I saw it for sale, I went ahead, you know, it was, it was that auction on eBay and, and there's only like, I, I think there's not many, there's, there's less than a hundred of those in a 9.8 grade. So I wanted to, 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 to get it while I, I went ahead and started the run. But the very first GI Joe book I picked up was a big one. And that is GI Joe, a real American hero, number one from 1982. And this is the first appearance of most of the major heroes in the G.I. Joe universe. And this was at auction on Comic Link several months ago. And I finally did pull the trigger on it. This is the direct edition, as you can see there with the Spider-Man head. The newsstand goes for quite a bit more money. Uh, but I was very happy that the price has come back down enough that I was able to finally pick up G.I. Joe number one. I did have this one growing up as a child. Uh, I wasn't very old. I was, let's see, I, I guess I was about five years old. So I probably bought it secondhand. Uh, at a comic book shop and uh, this is the first appearance of I believe Scarlet, Snake Eyes, uh, Stalker and obviously Cobra Commander and you know just some of the most you know some of the big big heroes and villains from the G.I. Joe universe and it's just awesome to finally get a G.I. Joe number one in a direct edition in a CGC 9.8 and then the other one speaking of Todd McFarlane is this one. This is one I never had growing up, but I always wanted it, and that is G.I. Joe Special, number one from 1995. This has a cover homage to uh, Spider-Man number one, uh, that famous Todd McFarlane cover of Spider-Man, but this one shows Snake Eyes kind of in the same crouch as Spider-Man in Spider-Man number one from, I believe it was 1990 or 1991. Uh, he didn't do this cover, but he did the art. Todd McFarlane did do the interior art for this one, and that's a big misnomer that a lot of people uh, don't know is that Todd McFarlane did not do this cover. This is just an homage uh, because Todd McFarlane was involved with the the artwork for this special. And what what is this G.I. Joe special? This is a reprint of uh, G.I. Joe number 61 where Cobra Commander dies. So uh, in this issue, the death of Cobra Commander, G.I. Joe special number one. So I, I just thought that given I loved Todd McFarlane art and he, he was involved in this and that this is a very tough one to get in a 9.8. Uh, you know, G.I. Joe Special number one, there's not many of those on the census either. I think there's less than 100 of that as well. Uh, so it's a fa fairly pricey book. And actually, it's it's almost as expensive, if not more expensive, than G.I. Joe number one. I think G.I. Joe number one is a more important book, uh, you know, for, for a lot of us from the 1980s and our childhood. But uh, this one is just a lot tougher to get in a 9.8. But those are the three G.I. Joe books I picked up uh, to kind of relive my childhood and I've got one more uh, that's kind of childhood related maybe two more that are childhood related that we're going to show you next next up in the continuing saga of reliving my childhood at 2023 prices 
Uh, you know, no, no picture of the 1980s toy lines is complete without talking about, obviously, Star Wars, obviously G.I. Joe, and then finally, at least for me, it was Transformers. And so I did pick up Transformers number one in a direct edition from 1984. This is the origin and first appearance of the Autobots and the Decepticons. This is a Bill Sienkiewicz cover, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, he's a pretty famous artist for those of you who, who don't follow comics that closely. It's not my favorite cover, to be honest with you. It's, it's not a cover that I particularly think is that great, uh, but it shows Optimus Prime in the middle of a battle with Laserbeak and a few of the other Decepticons. Uh, but it is a book that's tougher to get in a 9.8 grade versus G.I. Joe number one. So as a result, it's a lot more expensive. And the timing wasn't great. It, the, the, the Transformers movie uh, was just in the theaters, Rise of the Beasts. So it was a little tricky in terms of finding one at a fair price, but I did finally get one that I thought was a pretty fair price. This was freshly graded. It has no spine ticks. It's just an absolutely perfect copy with very deep, rich colors. That's something to keep in mind if you're looking for a Transformers number one, is that for some reason this cover can fade really easily, even 9.8 grades. Uh, you know, if they didn't get, if the ink didn't strike on the paper properly, there are some 9.8s out there with a, a little bit more of a faded look versus this very vibrant cover that I've got for this one. So uh, there, when I bought mine on Comic Link, there were two copies for sale at the same time. And one of them was this one, and it had very, very deep, rich colors to it, freshly graded. And the other one was also freshly graded, but it was very faded in terms of the, of the uh, colors on it. So I went ahead and paid up a little bit for this one versus the, the other one sold, I think, for about $100 less. But I'm happy I got this one because uh, once I got it in hand, I was really impressed with just how clean that copy was. And while not really a toy line I played with, this book uh, represents a movie that was one of my favorites and uh, that is Predator number one. So this is the first appearance of the Predator in comics. I'll take it out of the bag so you can get a closer look at it. But uh, this was a Dark Horse book from 1989. And so this has got a little bit lower print run than maybe some of the Marvel books from the same time period. But just an absolutely epic cover showing the Predator in the city with his, you know, uh, kind of primal scream going on uh just an awesome book and this is the first appearance of predator in comics there is also a second print that's quite a bit cheaper maybe about half the price of what you'll pay for this book and uh, I, I believe it was disney or somebody just got the rights back to predator and alien so you can probably expect more uh, movies or or disney plus content for uh, for the Predator and Aliens moving forward, but I didn't buy it to like speculate it on or anything like that. I just bought it because I've always wanted the Predator number one. Uh, this it's just one of those covers that really speaks to me and kind of you know the Predator is definitely even today one of my favorite movies. I, I, I think it's aged really well uh, despite kind of the outdated special effects and everything. But uh, you know along with GI the GI Joe books, but these two kind of represent part of my childhood from the you know eighties. And uh, I just thought they were kind of books that were necessary to add to my collection. And I think we've got some Batman books next before we dig into some really nice Star Wars books. So I did pick up three different Batman books. You know, if you guys watch my comic videos, you know that Batman, Wolverine, Spider-Man are kind of my three big heroes that I really like. And this is probably of the three, this is easily kind of the more, most common. And uh, that's Batman the Killing Joke from... Uh, 1988 and this is where the Joker cripples Barbara, Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, and she's kind of confined to a wheelchair after but it's a pretty timeless cover and uh, very easy to find in a 9.8 grade because it was a hard stock kind of book uh, so it's it's relatively uh, straightforward to find one of these in a 9.8 but you know I figured if I was a Batman fan then uh, this this book is certainly one to kind of have and you know hold and it's just kind of a pride of ownership thing. There's like 13 or 14 or 15 different printings for this book. So very easy to get yourself a copy of a 9.8 grade for Batman, The Killing Joke. This is a one shot, uh, but, but you know, kind of a timeless book that everyone kind of knows and loves. So uh, absolutely love that cover. Uh, the next one is a big one. And this is one, I, this is my first time picking up anything on Instagram. This was from Grails Comics, Grails with a Z, Comics with an X. And they had this one listed, and that one is Batman Adventures 12 uh, from 1993. And it's hard to believe that Harley Quinn was never introduced until 1993. So it's, it's pretty amazing she hasn't been around really that long. 
the, the comic book cover kind of, to me, uh, it, it's one of those timeless covers. And uh, it, it actually feels, when you look at the book, it feels like something from the 50s or 60s, right? It's just got such a great, simple, clean look to it. But this is the first comic book appearance of Harley Quinn. Now, it says out of continuity. In continuity, it's Batman, uh, Harley Quinn, the one shot that came out around the same time, a little bit later maybe. Uh, but this is the big one. This is kind of her first true, in terms of uh, timeline, uh, in terms of comic book releases, this is Harley Quinn's first appearance. And again, you know, this is a book that has come way back down in price. This thing really hit some massive numbers. The newsstand for this is a direct edition, obviously. The newsstand for this book, even today, can go for almost $5,000. So uh, I did not elect for the newsstand because it's it's a very, very expensive book. But this is also a very expensive book, even in the direct edition in a 9.8 grade. Uh, but easily, this is my best Batman book now. And uh, to have a, a, a pretty major character like Harley Quinn, to have her first ever comic book, uh, it's pretty special. Pretty, pretty special book to have and uh, very happy to have it. Very clean book, a very smooth transaction. You know, on Instagram, Grails Comics just posts books, po posts one photo and said, here's the price. And you can, uh, you can send a, a direct message to, to negotiate, which is what I did for this book. And uh, it was smooth, very smooth transaction and uh, very happy with the condition of it. So uh, it was, this one also was freshly graded. It was freshly graded about two months ago. So can't complain about that one. The other big one I got was a, was a Comic Link purchase. And this is another book that if you're a Batman fan, it's almost a must have for your collection. And that's Batman The Dark Knight Returns number one. Uh, it's the first appearance of Carrie Kelly, but that's not really why you're getting this book. This book really is the first modern interpretation of Batman, where he's grittier, older, jaded, more violent. And I think a lot of Christopher Nolan's trilogy with Christian Bale uh, really kind of came, you know, the, the aura of, of Batman in this book uh, is what uh, has driven the modern interpretation of Batman in, in movies and things like that. So uh, it's a pretty famous book. Frank Miller story and cover. Frank Miller and uh, Klaus Jensen. Um, I'm sure I'm mingling his name. It's a very simple book. Very, very tough to find in a clean case, though. Uh, you know, there's always a lot of scuff because of the background being blue like this. This is just one of those books that's extremely difficult to get without major scuffs to the inner well liner. And so, you know, when I got mine, I was okay with it, but it wasn't great. So I sent it back into CGC to have it recased. And it still didn't come back perfect. There's still some light scuffs on the back, but it's, it's pretty minimal. But given how simple the art is on it, every little, little scuff will show up on this book. So uh, just, it's just something to be aware of that not every 9.8 is created equally, as I'm sure you know if you collect 9.8s, but uh, getting a really clean one without any kind of scuffs to the inner wall liner is very tough to do. And this one is as close as you can get to it uh, because I, was, I just decided to send it back in to get it recased. Um, so that was about another 20 bucks or so, 30 bucks. Uh, but awesome book, a, a pretty important book. It's pro it probably, most people would argue that this book kind of ushered in the copper age for, for comics. Uh, obviously the bronze age went from like 19, what, 1970s to early eighties. And while this book came out in 86, most people would say that this is certainly one of the most top, easily top five, if not top three important books for ushering in a more kind of violent, uh, a more gray area type of hero uh, in terms of like their morals or you know the the violence that is associated with with a lot of our heroes and you know and a lot of a lot of this book uh inspired current modern media, media and and movies so it's just one of those really important books from the 1980s that I thought was important to have for my Batman collection but you know here's just three incredible Batman books that are now part of the collection I don't have a huge Batman collection but uh, this is a, a pretty amazing run uh, to put together with Batman the Killing Joke, the first appearance of Harley Quinn in Batman Adventures 12, and then Batman the Dark Knight Returns number one, the pretty famous uh, Frank Miller storyline. So uh, I think that's enough for non-Star Wars books, but I've got some Star Wars heaters that we're going to show you next. These are two books that I already had in my collection, and I'm not pulling out some of these older books just to like brag or you know just say, hey, look what I got. It's more to explain why I picked up 
the books I'm picking up because a lot of them are complementary to existing books in my collection. So that's why I do it. And I just think it's kind of cool to see them all together, but just understand that I'm, this is not a bragging type of video. I just le at least like to teach folks about different books, but uh, this is Star Wars number 21. And this one over here is Star Wars number 35. And what's the importance of these two books? But uh, this is the first original Darth Vader story, solo story in Star Wars comic books. So obviously you had the adaptations of, the, of A New Hope and then uh, The Empire Strikes Back uh, was after this book. So between Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, there was a window there where Marvel needed to come up with their own stories. And so one of those stories was Shadow of a Dark Lord. And uh, so this is the very first solo story for, for Darth Vader. And uh, the, Star Wars number 35 is the first face-to-face -face meeting non-canon between Luke and Darth Vader. And so while it's not canon, obviously their first true face-to-face -face meeting is in the Empire Strikes Back adaptation. But that, that, that series of adaptations hadn't been released yet. Uh, that started with Star Wars number 39. Well, Star Wars 35 is, is a non-canon adaptation, but it's such an epic cover. Very difficult to get in a 9.8 grade, and I actually have two of these in a 9.8. I, I absolutely love that cover, the Dark Lord's Gambit. It just screams 1970s, even though it came out in May of 1980. So we got the first solo story for Vader. We've got the first face-to-face -face meeting of Luke and Vader. And then I just added this book, and that one is an Empire Strikes Back adaptation book. This is the conclusion of the Empire Strikes Back adaptation, uh, Star Wars issue number 44. So this is from February of 1981, and what's cool about this one is that this is the newsstand edition. So uh, it's got the barcode down here. Uh, and a, a lot of these early books from the 70s, they, are, they were almost all newsstands. It's actually more rare to get the non-newsstands for these 1978 and 1979 books, as I'll show you in a little while when I show you a different book. And then, but during the 19, you know, early 1980s, they almost all switched over to the direct editions with Spider-Man's head. So during that time frame, to get a, a newsstand, it's a little bit tougher to do. And I thought it was, this was a very fair price. It's somebody that watches the channel, apparently. Uh, they messaged me over eBay after I bought it and said, hey, is this action figure greater? And I said, it is. I, and he says, I, I watch your, your videos all the time. So uh, thank you for the purchase. And uh, the book is absolutely gorgeous. Now, we talked about the first solo story. We talked about the first face-to-face -face meeting. In this book, it follows The Empire Strikes Back, and this is the first time that Darth Vader tells Luke that he is his father. Uh, Duel of a Dark Lord. It also, even though it's 19, you know, early 1980s, everything about that cover screams 1970s. But what an awesome... I mean, look at this trilogy, folks. This is just an awesome set here to kind of cover key events within either the movies or within the comics, the original run of Marvel comics related to Darth Vader and Luke. And uh, just, just some pretty incredible books here. So now going back to what I was talking about of the direct versus the newsstand is the next book. And here that book is, it's Star Wars number 16 from 1978. Now, uh, as I was talking about, in the 1980s, they moved over to the Spider-Man head for direct editions. And, that, you know, in the 1980s, that's when kind of direct was overtaking newsstands. And by the 1990s, it's, you know, anytime you see a newsstand from the 1990s, that's extremely rare because almost everything was direct. Uh, obviously, in 1977, 78, 79, they were kind of transitioning over from everything being newsstand to what you see here with this blank box. And what this is, that this is a multi-pack edition, a Whitman's sample, uh, a Whitman's kind of a multi-pack that where they would send these sample books in packs direct to consumers or direct to comic shops. And they had uh, this blank box here. And, and eventually they moved over to the barcode with a slash through it. That's where most of them had it. But the ones that came in the multi-packs had this uh, this blank box here. So this is a very rare multi-pack edition. CGC just started labeling them as multi-pack editions. Uh, but this is the first appearance of Valance, the bounty hunter, Violet Valance. And uh, it's a pretty fantastic cover. It's a book that I've talked about at length in different market updates and things like that. But uh, death and destruction are his tools. The Star Warriors are his targets. And uh, it's just a fantastic book. And this is actually one of only two 9.8 grades uh, for the multi-pack edition of Star Wars issue 16. Although there are others prior to, uh, you know, CGC 
uh, actually labeling the differentiation between the standard newsstand of the time period versus the multi-pack Whitman's version. Uh, they, uh, they just started kind of breaking that out. So I, I have seen some examples of Star Wars 16 in a 9.8 grade with that blank box on eBay that were not labeled. They were kind of done, bef they were graded before CGC started segmenting them out. So it's not like it's really one of two, but I can tell you that it's a there's a lot fewer of these than there are of the standard newsstand, like you see for Star Wars number 21 to your left here. So a uh, pretty awesome book. I probably overpaid for it just a little bit, but I, I, I thought it'd be kind of cool to have, uh, you know, one of the rare kind of Whitman's direct examples for Star Wars 16. It's a book that was on my goal list for this year as well. And, uh, you know, in a, in a standard newsstand, you can probably pick it up for under $200 now. Uh, I paid quite a bit more than that for this multi-pack edition. But, uh, you know, I think in the current environment, it, it's probably like a more like a $300 book, if, if I had to guess. Uh, but a pretty awesome first appearance, kind of a secondary first appearance that I thought was worth taking a closer look at and, and showing to you guys now that I finally got one in hand. I talk about it enough in my Star Wars comic book updates and things like and what to buy videos, things like that. But pretty awesome to get that cover. It just looks fantastic. I've got one more big book, I think, and then we're all done. Next up, I've got another Mandalorian related book, uh, Boba Fett related book. And I've, I've already shown it briefly in, a, I think, a live stream. But I wanted to kind of show it alongside my Star Wars issue number 42 which is the first appearance of Boba Fett as well as Yoda in comics. Uh, probably one of my favorites in my collection. But I did finally pick up in an auction uh, Star Wars number 68. And Star Wars 68 is uh, you know, the first mention of the Mandalorian. The, of the Mandalorians, not the Mandalorian, but the Mandalorians uh, in comic books. It's got a flashback story for Boba Fett. Uh, CGC used to incorrectly label this as the origin of Boba Fett, but it really was just a flashback story. And uh, Finn Shiza, I think, is the name of the Mandalorian on the cover here. Uh, but a, a pretty a pretty key book as it relates to the Mandalorians as a whole, as well as uh, Boba Fett. And I just thought it was kind of a cool book to pair with my Star Wars 42. This book is actually, I think, nowadays probably more expensive than Star Wars 42, but in my opinion, Star Wars 42 is the better book to have uh, first, if I was going to get one of them first. And that's what I did. You know, I bought that one first uh, earlier this year, uh, but a few months ago, I did pick up Star Wars 68. It, this book had, it was really, really expensive for a while. It was like over $2,500, which was crazy. Even the price I paid for it was pretty crazy. And since that time, it's come back down even more a little bit. But uh, I think now's a, if you're looking for either one of these books, now's a really great time because uh, both of them have kind of come back down to earth a little bit, even from when I bought this one. But pretty awesome to have it in a 9.8. I think there's around 190 of those in a 9.8 versus... Uh, Star Wars number 42, where there's probably double or triple that number easily in a 9.8 grade. So this one tends to be a little bit more expensive just because it's harder to hit the 9.8 grade. I think because of the yellow background, every little spine tick shows up versus uh, the partially white background on this one. Uh, maybe some of the defects along the spine are hidden uh, when CGC is grading them a little bit easier versus this book. So that's just what I'm guessing. I, I would also guess that this one probably has a much smaller print run since this one came out in 1983, uh, post Empire Strikes Back, whereas this book was kind of during the heart of uh, the Empire Strikes Back and the frenzy related to it. So um, I, I would think that probably if I, you know, I haven't looked up the print runs for them, if it's even available, but I would guess that this is this print run is easily half of what Star Wars 42 is, but I could be wrong on that. So anyway, pretty awesome book there. And I wanted to share all these books. I know this video ran kind of long, so thanks for sticking with me this long. I do have a little slideshow for the end of this with uh, some kind of still shots of some of these books I picked up. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll be back soon.